Okay, hello, welcome to the Open Active W3C uh, community call for the 25th of March. Uh, I think this is a very well attended call, partly because we've got the COVID-19 uh, crisis going on really. Uh, so we'll be going through uh, many proposals um, related to moving events online and streaming classes. Because of the urgency of the situation and the speed with which the sector has had to adapt over the last uh, four or five days, really, uh, we're hoping to finalize as much of this as we possibly can and get this into the specification so that everybody can start publishing open data for remote and streaming events as soon as possible. So we might be moving at quite a clip. And if you didn't see my message, um, I've also added half an hour to the call today just to expedite matters as much as possible. Because we're a bit extended today, um, I see people are still joining us here. Um, because we're a bit extended today, I suspect not everybody on the call knows everybody. Um, so if we could all just start by introducing ourselves, I will lead off. I'm Timothy Hill. I'm the standards and technical lead for Open Active and uh, chair of the meeting. After that, uh, Alice, could you uh, give everyone a brief bio? Yeah, morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I don't even know what day of the week it is anymore. Um, I'm Alice John. Uh, I work for a company called Four Global. Um, I'm the business development manager there, and um, I'm working with MCR Active and Partners Kinetic Insight, and I'm in on the MCR Active membership hub and um, data portal which is of specific interest um, uh, for this forum. Fantastic, thank you Alice. Brett. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Brett Pearson, I'm Head of Sales and Marketing at um, EDM UK. We're Sport England's national governing body for group exercise and we are the owners of Classfinder who we work with ODI and I'm in for to create an open data platform for group exercise class listings. Fantastic, thank you, Brett. Uh, Rupert Jenner. Hello, I'm uh, Rupert, I'm the CEO of Playways. Uh, we are a uh, sports management uh, digital platform um, uh, and we um, have open data embedded in that platform. Uh, we've done a number of projects with open data clients um that's it okay thank you rupert uh charlie clark hi yeah uh, charlie clark uh i'm the commercial lead at playways so supporting rupert um so i work on most things for the class plant based on that side so working with a variety of employees, sector partnerships local authorities um, as well as local deliverers who are opening their data thank you charlie uh chris norfield Hi, uh, I'm from London Sport. We run Open Sessions, uh, which is about uploading activities to the Open Data Feeds, uh, and Get Active, which is an activity part of the site. We work with ININ and Aid. Thank you. Uh, Luke. Hi, my name's Luke. Um, I'm the software engineer for IMIN. Thank you. Izzy. Um... Hi, I'm Izzy Champion. I'm a data and innovation lead at Sport England. Um, I'm the kind of Sport England point of contact for all things open active. Thank you, Izzy. Uh, Joshua Levitt. Hi, I'm Josh, I'm a software developer for Playways. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, Michael. Hi, I'm Michael, and I'm also a software developer for Playways. <laughs> okay, quite a bit of Playways uh, representation. Uh, fantastic. Um, Nick. Sorry, frantically getting myself off mute there. Uh, yeah, Nick Evans, um, uh, work at, uh, at the ODI uh, uh, on, in technical engagement and also at IMIN. Uh, doing uh, mainly uh, work on, on standards related things to do with uh, the open data. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Nish. Hello, everyone. Nish here from IMIN. <clears throat> I think that brings our tally to three, so we're not quite as good as Playways. Maybe <laughs> next time. Um, and hello, Tom. 
Could you introduce yourself, please? Hello, Tom. Okay, well, we'll maybe come back to Tom in a moment. Um, hello, Atku uh, Topraxivan. Hi, everyone. This is Utku from uh, For Global Data Hub. Uh, I'm also sitting at the implementation board for Open Active and working with Alice, Nish, and Nick on the MCR Active project as well, which part of it is related to the Open Data project. So, hi, everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Louis Hampton. Hello, uh, Louis, are you there? Uh, hello. Hello, hi. Hey, uh, sorry, I've just, I've just arrived. Okay, I was just hoping for a quick intro, just so that everybody knows your background. Uh, sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Louis Hampton. I am a uh, back-end developer with Cuttlefish Multimedia Limited. We are the operators and maintainers of the sports suite suite of services, uh, including our activity finder, which is an open active data producer and consumer. Okay, thank you. And uh, Tom, are you able to uh, make yourself heard now? Can you hear me guys now? I can indeed. Sorry, I just had to switch up the headphones. Hi guys, I'm Tom Marley, uh, co-founder of Played, and we make open data activity finders for various customers across the country. Okay, fantastic. Thank you all for the introductions. Um, I'll now start sharing my screen so we can move through the agenda. There's a fair number of proposals, but they're all interrelated. Uh, so hopefully the process goes a little bit um, faster as we go on because uh, we'll have dealt with various implications as we proceed. Uh, let's see here. Okay, are you all seeing the presentation now? Or the slides. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. 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 okay. So as I said at the head of the meeting, um, lots and lots of activity providers are now moving events online, uh, typically through streaming, sometimes through um, downloadable or asynchronous video. And it's important to be able to accommodate that given the speed with which the sector has had to adjust to pretty much all physical locations being uh, closed down for the foreseeable future. Um, so I'll just take you through the proposals. These more or less run from the most general to the more specific in terms of their ordering. Um, so the first one is virtual locations. So this represents a situation in which a class that was normally held in a physical location like a yoga class or a fitness class is now being conducted online with the instructor streaming to people watching at home. Uh, immediately beneath that we have um, video objects or on-demand events. And this is more like your say conventional um, YouTube style video, where you've got a video that's online, available all the time. Um, essentially, you're just watching it, but you're watching it according to your schedule because it's available 24-7. Um, the rest of the proposals are really for how to best describe um, these two classes of objects, streaming and, and async video, um, describing whether or not any equipment is required to participate. Um, whether physical equipment such as, I don't know, yoga blocks or something like that, or whether it's about hardware support, whether you need like a microphone or a camera or something like that. Um, event attendance mode is about uh, indicating whether people are going to be participating online or physically. Maximum virtual attendee capacity, I hope is self-explanatory. This is about tracking the number of people who can or are uh, attending a virtual event. Event moved online is a new event status made just to flag up the fact that an event that was previously physical is now available virtually. Um, and then a final point about the guidance that we should offer regarding uh, these various classes of object. Uh, before I charge in, 
Uh, is there anything anybody on the call would like to add to that list? Is there anything people aren't seeing represented there that they think needs to be? I have one. Uh, this is a last minute addition. I've labeled it in the uh, in the GitHub as uh, levels. And I think it probably it may not take long, but it, uh, it's become apparent from the uh, various research conversations that uh, levels for online events becomes even more important because when people who are, don't know how to do yoga turn up to a level two or above yoga class, for example, it gets very messy and, and they don't get very much out of it. And the instructors get frustrated and it doesn't really work. Um, so uh, it's, it was always a problem, but uh, it's even more a problem with online because there's people trying stuff. Um, so they just need to know uh, which class to try. Right. Okay. Um, we, I think I'll move that in before guidance then. Um, um, yeah, the, I'm a little hesitant about that one simply because levels, of course, are quite difficult to describe anyway. Um, maybe this means that we finally have to force a decision, which might be. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, I think I think it's literally just that. I think the proposal was there. It's just a case of maybe maybe um, getting it to beta. Right. Okay. Uh, anyone else with any additions to the agenda? Um, only maybe depending on what you discuss within the first one mm -hmm. in terms of um, regulations and licenses. So you may have already covered it, but if not, there's um, some legal issues for that. Okay, right. I will make a note of that. Um, at the very least, we can add that onto the thread as something that needs to be addressed. Um, so moving, moving through the agenda then, starting with virtual locations. Um, I've already described what these consist of, and I think it's fairly self-explanatory. In concrete terms, it's basically, of course, um, streaming video, typically. Um, this is obviously uh, a fairly new area for us to explore. Um, the first question is how we, how we treat this at all, in that physical events already had a location field, um, and it would be possible simply to treat virtual locations as a variation on location. Um, the difficulty with that, this, is that um, this makes location into an array. There could be more than one location possible, and it wouldn't be entirely clear that one was a physical and one was a virtual location. Um, Another side effect of this is that all of our tooling is made to support only one single location. So it makes it difficult to support multiple locations. Um, if we treat location, virtual location as a separate field in addition to location, that makes tooling questions easier and the semantics easier. Um, but there is still a limitation that there can be only one virtual location supported by our tooling as it currently exists. Um, a virtual location normally just consists of a URL, in fact, it's basically a website or a web page that you're pointing to. Um, so I guess the first question to ask is, is a single virtual location sufficient or do we need to support more than one? I wonder whether people might be streaming on both Facebook Live and Instagram, for example. Mm -hmm. I, to be honest, I have no idea if that's actually possible, but um, it feels like people might have the same session happening in multiple locations. Um, yeah, that could be a use case I could imagine, but I guess it would be the same content potentially. Going I'd like to add that it is, it is absolutely possible to stream to multiple virtual locations, as in literal possibility, um, synchronously at the same time. Um, the, for instance, the most popular piece of software used for streaming uh, this sort of data is open broadcasting software, which is a, a free piece of software that I encourage um, anyone who's interested to have a look at. Uh, it can be used to stream to multiple locations at once. 
um, including places like Facebook and also um, YouTube streaming, Facebook live streaming um, and, and the like, uh, Zoom as well, I believe. Um, and it's definitely we definitely need to make sure that virtual location is, uh, since it's new, I think we have the opportunity to make that an array to begin with. Okay. Um, which which would give us some edge on um, extensibility for that property. So uh, as a, as a um, another thought to kind of throw in here, um, uh, speaking to the various instructors and um, and and talking about the different use cases, I think it it might be interesting framing probably uh, maybe ahead of uh, uh, all of these issues just to think about what exactly we're talking about making open uh, the, the kind of data we're talking about here and. Um, and I, I suppose it's a, it's a good question about whether um, the primary purpose of what we're doing is to put Facebook Live and uh, Instagram Live videos um, into open data. It's a don't know, it's a kind of open question. Um, it seems to me that at the moment, it's quite easy to find that stuff um, because there's a lot of it going on. They've got masses of, you know, some of those, um, some of those classes have got millions of viewers. Um, but uh, the other side of it, which is the kind of more interactive side where you've got a Zoom call um, and you've got, you know, maybe maybe 15 people participating and there's the cameras are on and you're having a more engaged session. Potentially you're paying for that as well. Um, that's that's something which people haven't really figured out a platform for um, for distribution yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a kind of thought into, I mean, whether um, uh, a, a potential counterpoint to um, extensibility because it's 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 physically possible um, is just whether, um, for the sake of simplicity, it would be worth um, thinking about. I mean, if if there is if they've got a platform and and they're they're broadcasting, then maybe putting their primary um, platform in there, uh, given that most people seem to be just using one at the moment. Um, but there's no harm in extensibility, I suppose, to, 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 to this point. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of if, if part of our guiding principle maybe here should be, as we go through all of these questions, there's a lot of things that are possible. And I think in each one of these properties, we could definitely expand them uh, uh, in a number of different directions to cover a number of different extensibility cases. Um, and potentially one of the, the other benefits we have of doing this uh, at this stage is that we're talking about, we're not gonna get this into the actual spec itself within the time scale. So nothing is gonna be in, in set in stone. These are all beta properties. Um, so we, we have the opportunity to, um, to experiment. Um, and also we have the opportunity to keep things simple where they can be simple for the sake of speed. Um, already talking to some booking systems that are like, well, yeah, well, what's the minimum I can do here to get this working? Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's, that's maybe some, some thoughts. Sure, I mean, I guess, I guess the counter, argument to that is that if we have a lot of people who implement in one particular direction, it becomes quite difficult to modify the specification in the face of widespread implementation decisions, right? So if we say it's a single property now, um, <laughs> and then we decide that an array is desirable, uh, it becomes difficult. Um, I guess Sorry, quick question, for Brett, EMD, um, not being a techie, um, and I, I appreciate I tend to oversimplify things. It's the way my head works. Um, in terms of the location, mm -hmm. <laughs> if I'm an instructor and I'm not in my natural gym, community hall, wherever it might be, I'm now doing it either in my garage, front room, or, you know, whatever it might be in the current climate. Is that not the location rather than the platform that you're using to distribute it? So there would only be one location? Um, I mean, I think the point of the location field is really more to... Yes, that's the difference between location, the, the property. Sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was, I was just going to say, really, I think the force of the location property is to let attendees know where they have to be. Uh, uh, yeah. And yeah, of course, in the case of physical locations, uh, those two naturally imply each other. Uh, but virtual location less, but yeah, I don't. Th I don't think we'd be expecting the instructors to reveal their physical whereabouts uh, for for publishing purposes. Oh no, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. I didn't say you know, <laughs> I didn't mean come to thirty two Acacia Avenue. 
what I no. meant was, um, so for example, one of our registered instructors with us is already online, her name's Anna Martin. Uh, she's a PT and a Group X instructor. Um, she, I mean, she's fortunate to have her own studio um, and hosts everything on her website. So she pinpoints everything to her own website. So it's Anna Martin, uh, well, it's always moving forward.com. Um, and then it, she she promotes it across various platforms rather than hosts it on various right, right, yeah. pl platforms. Um, so it, it, it's, I guess it's that singular URL pinpoint that you go to her website to stream it rather than her pushing it out across multiple delivery platforms. That's right, yes. It's where people have to go to participate in or follow the event. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry, Nick, and your point was? Oh, so just on, um, it was actually on the previous uh, question of whether to go array or not array now. Uh, another a reason for uh, not array, <laughs> not meaning to, to be contrary on the first point at all, but um, just to, uh, just wanted to get all the thought, the points out, um, is that because, because we need to track, when we move from beta to um, a full blown property, there'll have to be a bit of work for everyone anyway in refactoring their code to account for that. So removing the beta prefix um, so that same little bit of refactoring could easily move that that same property to an array form if we, we needed it to be right if that was the direction of travel um, the actual the other the other way in some ways is more difficult right if you've got yeah. something that's an array then you've already kind of everything's got to account for multiple and as soon as you're in a many scenario the UI's got to account for multiple everything's got to account for multiple and so uh, you've got to kind of really um, whereas if you're doing it if you're doing it uh, right, if you've yeah. got everything is one and then you've gone many, you could just, you know, display the first one until you can support many on your UI. Um, so it's kind of, it's kind of the, the simple case for, for implementation is, is one. Uh, and extensibility is still possible with many later. Uh, but, but it's, it's uh, yeah, maybe, maybe more difficult to go many to one, uh, if you sort of mean, rather than one to many. Well, can we maybe do uh, a do, quick... Do we think it's likely that we will go from many to one? Well, I guess if no one's actually posted more than one link, um, well, I, I suppose my, my uh, there's a slightly separate point because, um, it, and, and I've already commented some of this stuff on the issue, but I, I actually wonder whether the URL for this is gonna be used that much for virtual location because, because most people are gonna have their, their stuff behind a paywall if they're using this mechanism for distribution. I don't think I'm necessarily tuning because I think a lot of local authorities have put on free sessions and our parks, for example, will all want to put, put their URL in if they can. Yeah. Okay. Do you I think, think they'll have it? Decide to have a lot of free stuff, especially from the local authorities that can no longer deliver as they normally would in their parks and stuff. They'll try and be delivering externally. We have at least one example of that in Slough. Sure. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Well, can we do a quick survey then um, of where people, what people foresee in the immediate future, as in like next week, whether they're going to be wanting to publish one or multiple values here? Uh, Rupert here from Playways. Uh, we have um, already um, uh, implemented both on the publishing and on the consumer side of, mm -hmm. of this solution for just one URL. Right, okay. it, it does certainly make it simpler for us. Uh, it would add time to our implementation to extend to more than one. I don't, I don't really see why, I mean, if, if someone was publishing two multiple streams, uh, then the participant you're asking the participant to make a decision as to which one they want to watch. Is that likely to be a, a, a sort of worthwhile decision <laughs> to offer participants? I mean, if I was going to attend a session, I w wouldn't really much care um, how I was going to watch it. I just want to click a button to start the video. Um, yeah, I think it's worth it. I guess the reason why people be doing it to multiple places is to try and reach different audiences, right? You might have... Yeah. 100 people who follow you on Facebook and 200 people who follow you on Instagram and they might not be the, the same people. Um, hence why you do the multiple streaming. Um, yeah, so th 
as long as you've got one place that people can reach you, it doesn't really matter if it's which one it is. I that's guess you probably have a preference. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, I, I, you know, if you're publishing to multiple places, it's because you're, it's about reach, isn't it? But it, you know, if you've got a participant who's already come to a finder, um, that doesn't really come into, into play. Um, so you can, also, they can just choose one which they want to publish to the finder and uh, you know th there's no downside to them not publishing the other ones to the finder because the person the participants already there i'd have to agree with rupert to be fair <clears throat> i mean if, if you if i'm an instructor i i'd have a a, a central um place where it's going to be distributed the other platforms you could just use them as signposting right okay yeah um, um, I just wonder if Chris's point in the chat is worth picking up at this point, or... Oh, sorry, I, I missed Chris's point in the chat. Hold on. Oh, no, no, please, please. Yeah, it was just about the, whether there are specific mm -hmm. URLs ahead of time for specific sessions, um, or if some instructors just use a more gen general, come back at three o'clock tomorrow and then a post appears, and that would then have a specific URL, but that may be overcome by putting their Facebook URL in there, or their website URL. I think quite a few of them will have some sort of membership. Um, so you would actually go to a gateway page and go through that to get to the thing that you're allowed to see because you paid for it. And that's sort of the same thing there. It's like there's the gate page and if you are a member of the group or whatever then you, you can go in and, and see the post uh, without knowing what the post is in advance. Okay, does, uh, are there any other uh, views on this? I had a quick thought about the multiple URLs, which was... Yeah, the, the multiple URLs was something that we've already uh, um, accommodated. Um, because if you're running a paid for session, and you're, let's say you're running that every, every morning, uh, what you don't want to be um, giving to people is is one URL. Um, so this is my Zoom link. Mm -hmm. So for for each and every one of those sessions, they're going to want to have a uh, unique identifier uh, on each one. So in Playways, if if you set up a uh, a schedule of sessions, a repeating session as we call it, um, then um, uh, there is the ability to change the URL um, for for each one. Uh, but but in our implementation at the moment, the URL is a mandatory field for each session. Right. Okay. So each, in that case, so just to, so I understand, so each opportunity, each uh, activity has one URL, but you might have a series of activities, in which case you then end up with multiple URLs. In yeah. Right. You can have either or. You could have the same URL. If, so if, if it was a free session then it makes sense to just have one URL. But if it's, if it's a bookable uh, session that you're charging for, then you'd want to have a different URL for each one. Right. Otherwise, otherwise people would just keep using the same URL and not booking. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> but so, however, it is possible to attach a, one virtual location to each yes. scheduled session in open active terms. Yes. Um, so a single value is, is fine, given that there are multiple sessions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just on the subject of location, so we're also having a a physical location as well, um, which is an optional field, mm -hmm. um, and and that is to enable consumers of the open data. So using one of our finder widgets, uh, we could give that to Active Westminster, and they can prioritise sessions that are being run by people within the Westminster region. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and certainly uh, could not could indeed we look at um, having uh, a session series without a virtual location and for multiple virtual locations actually have multiple scheduled sessions, each with their own virtual location? I'm sorry you lost me. Yeah, and me. <laughs> <laughs> I got about halfway through that. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I'm having a couple of connection issues. Can, can everybody hear me? Yep. Okay, um, so my suggestion is that if there is a single virtual location on each uh, scheduled session, um, could we then look to, in the use case whereby we do want multiple virtual locations, actually to use different scheduled sessions, each with a different virtual location? Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
but that should be that should be fine. Um, At least in terms of the open active specification, that's that would be the recommended solution. Would that create further complexity though? Because then you'd have duplicate events, wouldn't you? If you're thinking about how that looks in a UI. So there's if someone's got a, like a big list of all the sessions that are upcoming with a little link next to each one saying view or sign up, um, then uh, yeah, that might create duplicates in that view. Yeah, it would do. Uh, but I mean, the question is, is uh, I mean, would uh, provide would uh, have would they be doing that? I mean. Yeah, I mean, people could do that in Playways. I mean, you can set up as many series of sessions as you like. Um, you could have your Instagram one, your Facebook one, your, your Zoom one, but uh, um, there's nothing to stop people from doing that. But uh, it's just a question of whether they would actually do it. Yeah, I think I just I keep coming back to this idea that the, the, the primary focus of the, what we're doing here is not the, the, the people that are probably going to be broadcasting at the scale of having multiple, uh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe that, maybe there will be, maybe there will be. Um, but it, it's it, the, to do that, you require significantly more software than well, or tech, technical expertise that, and production uh, thinking than a lot of these folks who have just kind of grabbed their iPhone and, and plugged it into a, got their AirPods, and put it on a tripod, um, or, or whatever. Um, and in some cases, there is, there is, you know, there is high value stuff going on. Um, but, but yeah, I guess it's that same point of like, if it, yes, but if it is high value and there's already 3 million people viewing, it doesn't matter which platform you're looking at it through. Um. I think, I think given that it's an urgent situation, it really is about currently existing practice uh, because there is some flexibility moving from beta into the specification in future. Um, so it really is about whether there is a need to have uh, multiple right at this moment, or whether single, given the simplicity of implementation, will do the trick. Um, I think. I think if I will, if you were to ask a different question, which is, do we want a complicated feature which is going to be less implemented because of the cost, or a simple feature that's going to be more well implemented because every booking system will will adopt it because it's cheaper? Potentially, the cheaper option, which is going to be more well supported is better than a more expensive option. There's another way of saying it. Yeah, I think it's maybe an invidious way of saying it. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but yeah, but I can see the other view, right? It's just, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It's one of those things, if it's an edge case and then everyone's doing extra work for the edge case, is it worth that extra work? Um, and I yeah. guess if we're, yeah, th th this is precisely why I was asking is, is I'm trying to ascertain whether for people on this call, this is an edge case or not. Right, exactly. Yeah, good, good point. In, in fact, the impression that I'm getting is that one value is in fact sufficient and that modeling using multiple schedule, you know, attaching a single value to multiple scheduled sessions um, would normally be the way forward if you're concerned is that people would keep on logging into the same session and therefore not charging uh, for that. It doesn't particularly help. It creates complications if you decide you're going to create a session series for each media stream that you're hoping to publish to. That becomes a different issue. Um, but that for most cases, a single value, in fact, will cover it right now. Does that sound like an accurate summary to people on the call? Yeah, I would um, it, it vote in the favor of simplicity in, in this instance. Yeah, yeah, agreed. We're supporters of simplicity. Okay. <laughs> simplicity, simplicity takes the day. Yeah, good one. <laughs> oh, yeah. wait. I think I'm, I'm, happy as long, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy as long as this is reviewed when we get to the end of the beta stage for it. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and we have a look at it again and see how it's being used and whether we get any um, feedback from people on not being able to do it. And if that feedback isn't there, then it can be swiftly ignored. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, yeah, it really is just about the sort of strange times we're in right now. But, uh, you know, yeah, normally I'd like a more extended process. And I think we do 
have that more extended review process, but <laughs> once the ground under our feet is a little bit more stable, I think, yeah. We definitely want to make sure that, uh, and also we'll have some experience at that point. We'll have more data to build on and we can make a more informed decision then. Um, so if I can get back to the slides, which are currently blocked, here we go. Okay, so we will move forward with making a single virtual location URL available per event, but modeling each event as a, in a series as a separate event will allow separate URLs to be assigned. Um, the next big case is video, which is um, asynchronous. So you're not interacting with the instructor. It is not real time. Um, my slides seem to have disappeared. Um, so essentially, it's just a video that is uploaded and people can view it at their leisure. Um, the main, I think, there's, there's a sort of very general. Okay, right. So just message, just message oh. Tim the same. Yeah. <laughs> um, Tim, we might need to move somewhere. Wi-Fi is slightly better. Uh, I I am about three feet from the repeater right now. So. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I think I need to move somewhere where the network is somewhat better, like Iceland, maybe. Um, <laughs> but. Um, um, Sorry, so do we still have everybody? Yes, okay, good. We, we, yeah, we, we, all we missed was we, we didn't hear anything you said after we kind of concluded the last point and then you were about to, I think, move on, but then we just, it was just silent. Okay, uh, that's, that sounds like a natural break then, good. Um, I will re-share here. Um, so yeah, the next point is asynchronous video. So videos that are uploaded for consumption at the user's choice. There is a kind of top level architectural decision that needs to be made here. Um, I hope that this concern is not too abstract for people on the call. Um, this might turn into a Tim and Nick conversation. Um, the question is really how we model this and whether we think of this primarily as a recording of an event, which is what the system is currently geared towards with every event being an opportunity for exercise or whether we view it primarily as a video object. In real terms, what this means is if we treat it as an event, almost everything that's currently specified for the open active opportunity model just transfers onto this. And there's a couple of additional concerns that are added in to reflect the fact that this is a, an on-demand video. If we think of it as a video object, very little in the open active specification is that useful to us. It's very hard to transfer um, data points from events onto the video object. Um, but the video object is itself a playable artifact. There's all the information in a video object that you need in order to start up a player in your web browser, plus press play and go. Whereas on demand event doesn't support that kind of behavior. Um, to break it down further, although people can uh, stop me if I'm missing a nuance here, I think it's to some extent about user journey. So is it a question that when we publish an event, we're happy to essentially give a URL and say, go here to watch the video, or is it that you're saying, here is the video, you can watch it right now, you are one click away from participating in the event. Um, well, uh, sorry, Tim, just to ch check the characterization there. Is this not, isn't it a modeling question rather than, because there's no reason you couldn't embed a video in uh, on-demand event, in fact, and link the two. Um, is, isn't it more a question of whether video object is an event uh, or whether the thing we're describing is an event, which makes it, uh, you see what I mean? It's like, it's not, we can, we can implement the functionality in either case. Uh, well, how do we, how do we actually implement, how do we embed the video object in the on-demand event? Is there a field for that? No, there isn't currently a, uh, I, yeah, I checked. There's no, there's nothing in schema for that. Right, okay. So that's the follow on question there or a composite. I mean, do we just kind of meld the two to some extent and say video object now belongs to in on-demand event? 
Um, to me, it feels like maybe we go back to the previous point around simplicity, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's going to be a lot less work to go for an on-demand event and there's a way of embedding that, because I think, I don't want to speak for everyone, I think the stuff that Spoiling Learner may be doing, we probably just link to other people's websites. Mm -hmm. I think that will be fine. And for a sort of slightly quick and dirty version, maybe that's the easiest thing to do. But I appreciate that, as you say, ideally from a user journey perspective, you'd want to just be able to press play or embed the video in your in your site. But yeah, um, I that think would be my view. If memory serves, Tom, did you comment on the thread about the, the user journey you envisaged? Yeah, so I've um, been doing a bit of work around this for a current project, and we feel that it's important for or critical for the user journey to have the video embedded within the um, okay results page in, in our instance, um, rather than linking off to a different website to play the video. Um, and that's what, what we're building in. So I guess it would just be a case of whether we use, um, it would, but yeah, be fundamental that that was included. So I would yeah. uh, vote for yeah, a composite. I, a composite, I think, I think that's the thing. I think, I d because, because in order to go with video object alone, you would need to add a number of attributes to video objects like activity, you know, the number of from the activity list level as in beginner, intermediate, advanced. And when you add those attributes, it doesn't really make, those attributes don't make sense in the context of a video. Like a video itself has a frame rate and it has a size and it has a caption or whatever, uh, but it doesn't really, the, the, when we start talking about things like activity types, we're really talking about the event that the video is describing um, and therefore having an on-demand event which is naturally going to have all those properties because it's an event and so it, it inherits all those properties from the event so you get automatically you get level and accessibility and whatever else that might be relevant attendee instructions uh, if you want to put equipment information in there all of that stuff is there automatically and then if you want to then uh, link to the video uh, for tom's uh, the use case tom describes which which makes so much sense um, then you could put that as a link within the on-demand event and just you know this is the this is the video and embed in there then the, the you know the width the height the frame rate the uh, whatever else information about a video that there is um, but I guess that's that those, those properties kind of properties of the video uh, and it actually you know there might be several videos or there might be different um, types of video or I don't know like whatever in the future that might change and as we talked about with the last last point about maybe in the future there might be multiple uh, live stream options or single you know platform depending on what happens um, in the same way here we might allow for that extensibility by changing it in the future but um, fundamentally if the the objects we're modeling are what they are then that stuff will be easy to change just you're just changing it from from a single to a many in terms of multiple videos for example on the on-demand event you could just change it from a single to an array or back again and that's the only change you need to make similar to the last point whereas if we've embedded everything into one and we've kind of conflated the notion of a video and the notion of the event into one thing you've tied two things together that aren't really the same um, and then we that creates further modeling problems down the line we can't just we can change it easily. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the question is how a composite like this would work in open active. I mean, we just say, here's on demand event as defined by schema.org, plus we've added video object. Um, Could I um, did, oh, quickly sorry. Chris something on a, on a requirements kind of thing before we sort of open activize this? Um, <laughs> but uh, Wastefully certainly does on demand events that aren't videos. Mm -hmm. um, so we yeah. did in last year, for instance, where um, <clears throat> we took uh, the 5K uh, women's run, which uh, we managed to get some uh, fairly accurate splits from, and modelled it, and then we did a promotion of running against that and seeing how 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 far behind the fastest woman on a 5K you would come, which is not very. Uh, it was a bit nicer than that. But the idea being basically that, that that was something people could go and grab and do, a bit like going and grabbing and doing a video, um, but it wasn't a video. So I, I, I certainly would put my hand up for it, it being some on-demand event with properties as opposed to a video object that has event-like stuff inside it. And uh, I guess you could, you could extend that into audio-only events, right? In, in the case that it's not, nothing to do with a video. Well, that's also true. Yeah. So we, 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 if you, if you think of uh, potentially a um, 
doing something like a Caps 5K program kind of has on-demand events that are audio-only events to talk you through the stage of the, of the process you're going through. I'm not sure they would actually come out as events like this, but it's that kind of thing. Okay, so some of it, sorry, um, I think some of it might depend on which sector of the industry we're involved in. So if you look for us as independent Group X instructors, for them it's the same thing. So whether you licked, go, went onto Class Finder and clicked, a, I want to do a Pilates class, and it's normally a, you know, everyone active in Slough, for example. In the current climate, that doesn't exist. So the fact that the instructor may have a, a an online video is one and the same for us. So if you're if you're a participant, you just want to click and then either view the pre-recorded video or the live stream. It's 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 one and the same for our sector. Right. Okay. So you might want to. Hmm. Okay. Sorry. There's there's two separate issues here. I just want to go back for a moment to address the point Chris raised with Nick. Um, I think maybe it's possible just to generalize this. Then, if we say on demand event, and we take the super class of video object, which I think is media object in schema.org, I guess that would address the concern. Of course, we end up writing just a bit more guidance around the, how you use the particular kinds of media object. Um, but it seems like from a modeling perspective, that would do the trick in terms of supporting the different kinds of objects that you might want to support. So, so to be clear, you're talking about an array of a property inside on demand event, which is something like media, something which has got an array of media objects of which some can be video and some can be audio. Is that right? Um, I suppose that's a separate question. I was thinking probably a single value. Um, because from Chris's description, he was thinking more of some things that exist only as audio, some things that exist only as video. Right. Um, and again, given the difficulties of supporting lists of stuff. Yeah. Uh, um, side note, the, um, the schema.org on-demand event specification includes work featured and work performed, which are creative work types, which are inherited, I, um, inheritance of media object, video object, image object, Gr audio brilliant. object, etc. Okay, great. Fantastic. Gr great find. That's, yeah, that's exactly what we want, isn't it? Work features. Okay. So we're, that's great. Okay, good. Um, uh, I can put an example on the uh, GitHub issue, if you like, of how that might appear on our feed. That would be brilliant if you could do that. That would be fantastic. Um, okay, so that, <laughs> that neatly solves the, uh, the modeling uh, difficulty there. Um, but then returning to the point of there not being a distinction between, necessarily a distinction between streaming and asynchronous video. Huh. Um, I guess- Is there a way of like tagging them almost? So you could see from a data user perspective, you might only want to show the live stuff in one place, for example. So if there's a way of, I don't know whether that's oversimplifying it, almost tagging what's live, like you're watching it, so you have to be there at 7 a.m. or whatever to watch it versus stuff you can get anytime. I guess, I guess the preferred route from the instructor's point of view though is if you join me at nine, you can join me live. If you follow this link, after 9.30 when, I'm, when it's uploaded, you get it asynchronously um, so that people just, so that the user journeys just click on the link and participate to the fullest extent possible given the timing. Um, I, I mean, I would, I'm tempted to take YouTube's approach with this, which is uh, to suggest that we take YouTube's approach with this, which is that um, they, they have live and live is live and in that mode, you're you're in kind of I guess what we're talking about with um, with the virtual event stuff previously. Um, you've got to tune in at this time, and you can watch it, and it's there. Um, and as soon as you finish that live recording, um, YouTube then converts that into I guess what is effectively on demand. It saves it as a separate bit of, bit of media. If you refresh the page after the live thing's ended, um, you're actually not watching live anymore. You're watching the on demand thing. It's trans translated into that, and and sometimes. Um, 
platforms don't allow that to happen or sometimes you can turn that off so that if you actually get there at the end and the thing's finished a bit like iPlayer if you ever tried to watch something live on iPlayer and refresh the page after the program's done it will say this is going to be on on demand shortly uh, so you need to go back and, and there's a different link. So I wonder whether the, the way, if we follow that pattern, the, the, the other platforms do, whether on demand is actually a separate thing. So, you know, if there's a feed of uh, events and there's a feed of on demand, which may be separate, that maybe something disappears out of one or, you know, the event's finished, but then the on demand, it appears in the on, on demand feed as a separate video, a separate content. Mm -hmm. And th th those two things, because ultimately they're, the thing with on demand is it's a very different user experience. It's more like Netflix, isn't it? You're scrolling through categories of stuff because there's no time to really differentiate between two on demand videos. Um, maybe location, if you want to find things that are near you that have been recorded. Um, but you're, you're much more kind of um, not what's the next thing I can do, but what looks the nicest from the description. Um, so it's curated more potentially than, than just events are where you're just looking for the next thing in some cases. Okay, so in that case, really, the publication, in fact, there is a difference in terms of what's published between sync and async video, um, and it's down to the platform, essentially, to make that transfer as seamless as possible. And that's a widespread user journey mode so far, that people will understand this from iPlayer or YouTube um, interactions. Is that an accurate summary of what you were saying, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, and Facebook Live, I think it's the same. I don't know about Instagram, but yeah. Okay. So this does not, uh, this does not really affect feed publication, this desire for seamlessness. That's an application level question. Okay, we are near the top of the hour. Um, those were the two, I think, of the more tangled and abstract uh, questions. The rest are relatively concrete, so I'm hoping uh, we can just review them fairly quickly and integrate concrete suggestions as we go. Uh, well, let's see if that's actually possible. Um, before I go on, though, I, um, is does everyone feel that the asynchronous video question has been sufficiently resolved? Are there any lingering doubts? I'm happy with that solution suggested. And we... Okay. Okay, um, so here's, a, here's an issue just about how we indicate whether people at home need to have some kind of piece of equipment like a yoga block or um, an exercise ball or something like that. Um, the immediate use case for this is a desire to present a filter um, so that when you're looking for um, a class to participate in online, uh, you know whether you need to, ha to bring anything to have anything uh, at home already. Um, so this was proposed as a Boolean value or a Boolean flag just saying, yes, I, yes, you need equipment or no, you don't need additional equipment. Um, that works well for a filter. Um, is that sufficient given the necessity of moving quickly on this? One, I don't know whether it needs to be like, sorted out now, but I've definitely seen things where pe some people say equipment is optional, mm -hmm. just to add a confusion. Um, so as in they will, some, some people will kind of say, okay, if you've got dumbbells or whatever, then you can do this. If you don't, then do that. So they'll kind of adapt. Um, but I mean, I don't know how common that is and um, don't want that to be necessarily a blocker, just something we should flag. Okay, yeah. And, and indeed on one of the issues, uh, to follow, uh, in fact, the immediately following one about soft uh, hardware support, uh, we have that kind of three valued field. So it's certainly uh, uh, an available option. Um, the, other, the other thing that I've picked up from some of the calls I've had with instructors is that um, uh, that sometimes that you have to, <laughs> in these times, improvise. So although equipment might be required, the equipment is like two books that you have to like, or whatever, like, or a uh, encyclopedia, to Brit encyclopedia Britannica if you've got one lying around mm -hmm. so that there's uh, uh, yeah so that so there's like a like a need for a description field of some kind and um, now that might just be sufficient to have that as attendee instructions for now right because that's kind of what attendee instructions is is broadly for so if someone uh, ticks the box to say or or, in, or makes it required or or recommended 
or whatever the, the other value required or optional, um, then uh, yeah, then they could they could look at that field potentially. Okay, so so potentially some nuance in just how required required equipment is, making it a triple value, and then some guidance saying what specifically is required and what you gain or lose from not having the equipment uh, goes into the attendee instructions field. Is that the proposal? Would, would there be a, a defined list of these pieces of equipment? Um, uh, just when Nick said something about, you know, improvising with two books, um, if we're going to have it as a filter, uh, um, it, it could be quite tricky if, if it's not a, a, a defined list of things. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine coming up with a defined list that would be adequate to the task in any reasonable amount of time. <laughs> well, so that's a, it's a really good point, actually. So that I, th I, th I think part of the assumption here is if you're looking for a specific type of class, like a yoga class, you're probably going to know the kind of equipment you might need, like a yoga mat. Um, so equipment makes sense in the context of each activity um, enough that maybe a, an actual list at this stage isn't needed for, for kind of the majority of cases. There might be some weird edge cases. Um, and so some people might be looking for, example, a beginner's class with no equipment required is like probably a common one. Um, but if you're into like, I don't want beginners and I want, I want equipment required because my yoga instructor isn't doing online and I want to find another one or whatever equivalent, um, then yeah, that might be what you're using that for. I would guess that, um, you know, if you, it, we've got quite specific activity types. So if you had a kettlebell workout with equipment required checked, you would probably imply from that that you needed the kettlebells to work out with. Um, so so, certainly uh, yeah. in the short term, I think the, the idea of having a, a list of equipment is, is not going to be feasible because there's just too many things that could end up on there. And I think having, um, whether it requires the equipment or not, should be fairly intuitive to end users. Okay, so for the moment, and again, maybe for review, once we're trying to graduate from beta, for the moment, let's uh, simply rely on context and the attendee instructions field to convey the equipment required. Okay. I've got a follow on question, it's sort of similar. It's like, if someone's doing an event on Peloton or Zwift or Racefully, and you need to have Peloton or Zwift or Racefully in order to participate in it, you know, that's a sort of a required equipment. That's what it sort of shook loose in my head. Is the concept of um, apps or, uh, you know, in Peloton, you need a whole bike to, to be part of it. Is, is the concept of that anywhere in this sort of activity spec? I, have, I, I don't recall seeing it, but I'm, I'm not as deeply familiar as you guys. Uh, oh, okay, that's an interesting one. Um, yeah, I was I was kind of arguing for this on the schema.org thread when they were actually defining um, virtual location in schema. Um, I was trying to say that virtual location should be, I got I got shot down, you can go read it. <laughs> um, the, the, but I was trying to say that the um, virtual location should be a, a service that is more general than just uh, a location because okay. often you're joining a service and that service could be a platform like YouTube or it could be like you say, a Peloton or something else. Um, uh, but but yeah, I think they kind of went with the simpler option um, uh, and uh, and just rooted for location being uh, something that's actually, it's not even it doesn't even inherit place now it just is intangible. So uh, so a virtual location doesn't have any inherited properties other than the properties of thing, uh, the scheme.org um, base class. So uh, you have an intrinsic URL which would at least or URI which would at least give you. Uh, you know, it would indicate if it was a peloton.com slash blah 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 that that was a a link to a peloton activity. Yeah, so we've still got the name field and virtual location uh, yeah. and 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 the the URL field. So you could definitely have, and I think we kind of suggested that in the guidance here that that, that you, you would have the name of Zoom. The URL is you know Zoomer. The name could be racefully. The URL would be racefully.com slash. Okay, so so the the, there would be a potential job for the client if they wanted to call these out separately to have some look out of the cup of the domain of the virtual location in order to indicate which service was providing it. 
yeah although to be fair that's kind of how the same as stuff works anyway in schema so if you're if you're referencing social media urls you just have a, an array of urls you don't actually bother saying this is a facebook url because you're expected as a consumer to just know that that's a facebook url based on the form of the url itself um so we don't need to do anything more than just use use the, the correct urls okay that's good to know that that, that, that makes sense to me Okay, uh, well, it does segue naturally into the next point, which is um, interactive modes. Uh, sorry. Um, so this is specifically for streaming in cases where uh, it's possible to give camera, typically camera or microphone feedback to the instructor, possibly other interactive modes like keyboard input and so on and so forth. Um, We had some discussion about this already on, on the thread. Uh, the proposal as it exists now is that this is simply one value, which is called something like interactive mode um, or is interactive with three values of required, optional, or unavailable. Um, there was some discussion of whether it should be more specific than this, like um, you know, camera required, microphone required, that kind of thing. Um, I think the feeling when we were discussing it amongst ourselves um, was that that starts getting quite fine grained quite quickly. And it also removes a certain amount of judgment from the participant um, about what kind of interactive experience they feel they, they need or desire. Um, so right now this would simply be one data point is interactive with one of these three values attached to it. And that's it. Um, does this cover um, immediately existing use cases? Uh, and if not, where can we best convey the additional information required? It feels like building on what we just discussed, attending instructions feels like the obvious place to add that kind of, if you need a camera, if you need a microphone, et cetera. Um, in terms of use cases, I don't know, but yeah, just building on that same logic. Mm -hmm. um, is there a use case for this for events that are not virtual? Um, just thinking that if this is a property that we're adding to event, is this something that actually has a use outside of the virtual events that we have? Um, it might be a nomenclature problem because, of course, I think going to a physical event is kind of inherently interactive in the sense that if you go to like a yoga class or something, I guess you're expecting that the instructor will notice, um, you know, problems that you're having and give you specific instruction and that kind of thing. Um, so all physical classes are sort of by default interactive in that sense. Um, what kind of more extended interactive form were you were you envisaging uh, i'm just thinking in terms of whether obviously most activities are going to be interactive because you will have the opportunity to have back and forth with whoever is uh, leading the activity but it might offer us the opportunity to be more expressive about how you can interact with the leader of a given activity um, and it might limiting it to virtual events now seems potentially well limiting in the future yeah, that's really interesting. Um, because the um, the yeah, but I, I guess in 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 big classes, sometimes the instructor can't actually go around and check your form and and you know and give you hints and and pointers. But in small classes, maybe you get more attention. So I guess that maybe there is something in in the real world. Um, so I I totally see that, and I guess I guess part of me thinks that that's worth exploring but then there's a little bit of me that thinks also this is a beta field maybe we should be zoning in on virtual for the sake of the uh what we're doing now and then um looking to expand that out out later but i i, I think if we had more time and this wasn't like a super pressed thing that would that would almost certainly be uh, yeah i can see i can see us do, do we, we would probably want to do additional research right into into actually how does this work in in, in real classes and what kind of uh form of words could we use to suggest you know um coaching available or you know interactive coaching or uh feedback available or something but i guess finding finding words that works for all types of sport is probably not a simple thing to do so i think oh sorry i think in the current climate as well 
if they're delivering a live class, for them to be able to respond to comments, it needs to be a two-way feed. And a lot of them just do a one-way feed where their participants can see the instructor. Mm -hmm. um, if it's recorded, there isn't any of that because it's just, well, it's just iPlayer, YouTube, isn't it? You're just watching it. So again, you wouldn't get advice on posture, form, you know, access, you know, whatever it might be. Um, I think there's the option going forward of maybe having it as a communication pathway rather than a, a live dialogue. Uh, as, yeah. a, as a counter to uh, one of the suggestions in that, um, even if a activity is being live streamed by one of the many platforms that we've discussed already, it does still offer, I, I can't think of one that doesn't currently offer uh, feedback from participants in text form, even if they don't have any uh, specific equipment to allow them to distribute their own voice or video. Oh, no, they can, uh, well, certainly for our sect, if you like. I mean, they can certainly get feedback, but they, if they're delivering a live class, they wouldn't, they wouldn't be physically able to answer any points because they're too busy delivering the class. Yeah, so this is have, one of the, unless the they have instructors. An assistant, unless they have yeah. an assistant to sort of answer any questions, the instructor themselves is too busy, you know, jumping up and moving to the left and sticking their hands in the air and that type of thing. They wouldn't be able to tell, hold on, Janice, I need to reply to your text message. I think, in fact, it's fairly common, though, that you do get this kind of curious, like, um, shout out kind of mode. Um, if anybody watched that very highly viewed YouTube clip Monday morning for, for kids at home, um, I forget the name of the service, but it was a widely viewed streaming service. And essentially the instructor all the way through was kind of doing, and a shout out to Sean in Jamaica, who's watching this now. Um, so there- <laughs> Yeah, like Peloton do. Yeah, yeah okay. So there, there is sometimes this kind of constant um, feedback happening, um, even if it's not what you'd expect of a, of a conventional fitness class. Um, I, think, I, think, I think that what this is talking, talking to, that this kind of thing is, um, uh, I was talking to someone earlier who basically said that, that he, he purposely limits the size of his classes to 10 people because he wants to be able to give them feedback on form and finds it very difficult to do that when the number is greater than 10 with Zoom because everyone, you, you can't fit them all on the screen and et cetera. Um, and, and, and for that class, he's, he says very much he prefers them to use video. That's why I kind of suggested preferred rather than required at the back of that conversation um, because uh, he wouldn't force anyone to do it. And I, and I haven't found anyone yet who said that they would force or expect to force that, but, um, but would very much prefer it because that's the kind of point of the experience he's trying to create. If you want to sign up for a class where you don't get that feedback, there's lots of videos you can, you know, watch that yeah. are one way. Uh, and, and that's not the point of what, what he's trying to do. So I guess it depends on if you're, if you're looking, if you're a participant looking for that interactive experience that maybe you, you're you, more used to in the real world, in the virtual world, Versus if you're someone that just wants to kind of watch and um, not get that, not expect to turn your camera on and not expect to engage. I think that was probably the original sense of what this property was for. Okay, so I think that points to two needs. And the first is simply that possibly we need to think about what the nomenclature is for is interactive. Um, partly to narrow the scope so that it's just virtual things and we're not capturing what live interaction is like. Um, and also to capture that it's um, sort of personally interactive, I suppose, that it is about the instructor's uh, ability to deliver personalized instruction more than about just a general um, ability to have some kind of communication with each other. Um, I don't know what form of words that is, uh, but it, I think we probably do need to rename it. Um, the second point is that I suppose if we shift from preferred from required, it feels like the optional category no longer serves much of a purpose. I don't know what the semantics of optional are. Yeah, this is a good point, which makes it maybe just a Boolean. Maybe it's, it's, it's prefer camera on or something, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really, cru really crudely. <laughs> um, yeah, okay, so let's... Um, I think probably a little bit more thought needs to go into that. Probably not more than about a 10 or 15 minute discussion, but probably more than we have right now. 
So let's see if we can move that discussion onto the GitHub thread and come up with a, a crisp proposal and move that into a beta property shortly. I wonder, um, Tim, this is just, uh, just a suggestion because it, given the situation and everyone's keen to get on with this, I, I wonder if it's worth us trying to swiftly move to cover all the points by the, by the, the end of the call at half past. And then if anyone has an opportunity, wants to stay on the call for, a, for an additional 15 minutes to just round off and conclude everything, if there's any outstanding points, basically the idea being that by the end of the call, come what may, we will have the answer that we need to then by the end of the day, have all the tooling and, and documentation in place so everyone can, can kind of crack on. Because I'm just concerned that maybe if we don't do that, that we might, we, the, the normal process would absolutely involve lots of GitHubs and probably subsequent calls. But I just wonder if we, we should be more um, expedient than that. Yeah, um, I take your point. Um, let's aim for that. I'm, I'm a little skeptical about how feasible that is, given that the end of the day is not that far away. Um, However, yeah, I think we can at least come to a consensus about, about all points. Um, so that said, if, yeah, if anybody can, has some spare uh, brain cells to devote to the question of what to actually call this, um, that would be fantastic. And we'll move on to event attendance mode. Um, this is, I think, um, a fairly minor and uncontroversial point, um, he says, famous last words. This is really just about indicating that an event is physical, that it's virtual, or whether it's both. Um, so the proposal is that there would be this new attribute called event attendance mode available on events, and it could be defined as online, offline, or mixed. Uh, and this would just simplify, I suppose, parsing the data and knowing how to interpret it. Does that seem to cover all available use cases? Shall we simply move this into beta immediately? Hello? And, unless you have, um, well, no, in, in all cases, because it's a physical event. So I guess it has to happen somewhere. But this, but this is proposing that it's not required in the case that you're using uh, online only attendance mode. How does that affect uh, backwards compatibility for feed consumers that might be expecting a location to be there always? Uh, it's a good point. I guess th 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 that's really interesting. Yes. What would a feed consumer do when they've come across an online event? Uh, they don't know what to do with it. Well, they, they look very similar to current events, so, sorry, to um, to the normal events that we have. So, uh, yeah, I guess they would present it with a description uh, that looks, well, I'd, actually, you know what? I think that actually there's a, there's a more of a danger here, which it, they might not even say it's online then, right? They might not even put the word live in capital letters in front of it, like everyone seems to be doing on class, um, class pass right now to differentiate. Um, so, that is a risk. I don't it know what we do about on how that, they're then. using it, though. Surely. Sorry, how do you mean? Well, if it's um, say a result that's come up in from from filtering, if you're expecting it to be a physical activity, then location will be an important part of it. And if you're searching by location, then it won't even come up. Yes, if it's not included, it's true. Well, I have the data consumers are adding the data and understand all the problems. So if you've got no location, not the other thing rather than it being just way I said location specified with an on-demand event proposal is that location just represents where the instructor usually is which allows you to do things like the Westminster scenario finding things that are usually in Westminster literally um, but then of course that could be misinterpreted as well that's a real event that's happening in that place but actually they've, they've missed the event attendance mode property is now set to online only 
which, which might actually be interestingly why schema because i hadn't i hadn't clocked this before i was slightly skeptical about schema schema.org suggestion of using a different um event status property which is moved online um but that might be for compatibility because it, like you say that would potentially break people's stuff and maybe it's intentionally supposed to break people's stuff because if it's moved online and then you you throw the event out because you don't know what moved online means and you don't want to parse something you, yeah so maybe so maybe we we'd want to keep moved online just to flag in the data that actually this is different if you're a consumer not to display it as you usually would yeah i i like you have been skeptical of event moved online anyway because i felt like it was represented in other fields um yeah. and I, I'm, I have no proposed solution for this, but it certainly seems like for um, feed consumers who are still working with older versions of the spec, it's going to get very difficult for them uh, in the coming short while because of the situation with um, things like event moved online or indeed not having location, which was previously a required property. I have a strong suspicion that there will be some um, feed consumers that are not prepared for no location to be present and it may cause issues with their uh... is there is there a practical point here though which is that um oh sorry have you gone I... Uh, I, i'm still here very still there. um is there a practical point um that is at the moment we're all in lockdown so anything that's being displayed on the website at the moment can't really be misinterpreted well if someone if there's a data user that hasn't updated their stuff yet obviously a lot of the data feeds will be empty or or, or dry because everything's um being cancelled or is moved online um so yeah it's, it's, it's a tough one isn't it because i can see what you're saying but i, I just don't know how we because the scenario we're talking about is there's going to be websites out there that are using this data that are going to be incorrect because they can't pick up this property because it's it's on it's just they'll be ignoring it as what the spec tells them to do um and so there's incorrect information potentially that's being presented then because they might think the class is actually happening in a location um yeah and and especially given that obviously we are living in strange times but these times are temporary and i think there's no particular reason to uh bring issues to these to these sites in the short in the short to medium term when long term they would be absolutely fine with the current spec well the, I, I think it sounds like the options we have are either to do something that, that purposely breaks their stuff in a way that um will not therefore render events in in the way that they wouldn't be valid um so things like just not including location at all so that they can't possibly render it because without a location there geo search will probably break so actually excluding location is is what we want to do actively um or or indeed any other field that they would depend on to render but i can't think usefully how we can do that without renaming properties and other stuff uh, or types but all of that could be yeah so maybe in the short term it's just a case of excluding location but then if we do that then we're going to limit the, the westminster scenario we talked about earlier where you want to be able to keep things in westminster in one place so yeah, yeah to me um the uh breaking a website um that hasn't implemented virtual events yet is not as bad as having virtual events being misrepresented as events that happen at a location um i mean would having a separate field like a uh, affiliated location or something be acceptable but yeah, I guess the, the advantage of affiliated location is it also, or something like that, is that it also doesn't, um, uh, it's a, from a semantic point of view, it doesn't at all imply that it that it even happens in that place, whereas location, I guess, does. So we're, we're reusing the field, which is what schema.org loves to do. So, I mean, schema.org wouldn't be in favor of virtual location as a field, for example, but we're splitting it out for, um, for the sake of conformance. But yeah, Luke, I, I think that's, um, yeah, I could, I could definitely see the value in that. Breaks everyone's stuff in the right way. <laughs> Tim, have you come back? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I missed the crucial start of that uh, conversation. 
Um, well, so s summarizing it, basically, we, we, we pointed out that if, um, if we don't do something to, to make the current the data we're publishing about virtual invalid, um, then because of the nature of this, this property, which is just to indicate that it's online, but it's only a separate property that will be ignored by any current data user, that you can end up with um, da data being misrepresented. So uh, the proposal just now um, was to uh, use a separate property for the location as an affiliated location, where you're trying to say that this was originally there, but it's not anymore. Um, no, as a beta, pro it would have to be a beta property anyway. Yeah. And so argu arguably you could retire that beta property when we move to the full, the full spec change, because it might be a breaking change next anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and therefore uh, it's a beta property temporarily in this situation just to, avoid misrepresentation okay so, so uh, and spe sorry. specifically this is in reference to um making the location property uh, not no longer required which current feed consumers will be expecting so uh by not actually publicizing the load or not filling the location property that would cause um feed consumers to not display that at all Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So the, the, the proposal then would be we use virtual location and affiliated location. Uh, do not fill out location so as to essentially deliberately break implementations that are unaware. Um, and then event moved online is no longer relevant. Is that a good summary? Uh, I think that's a side effect that event moved online is no longer required. Um, and then what we can do is we can look at bringing event moved online and removing uh, beta um, affiliate location once we move to a new version of the specification. It's specifically for this inter interim period where uh, we want to support existing feeds wherever possible and we'd like to support those feeds once all of this blows over. So right. just making sure that those those feeds that are currently running the, that version of the spec will not break or misrepresent data between now. Right. Okay. I, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Um, maybe maybe I've misunderstood. So please just tell me to shut up if I have. But if um if then you're a a GLL for example who then does have a session that normally would take place in a physical location. And then your session has now you've now moved that session to an online broadcast or video, whatever it is. How would that be represented? Well, they would they would they would simply use this new property uh, for uh, that we're just talking about here to uh, indicate that it's online, um, and then that would and then remove the location or change the location to affiliated location uh, those two things together would break anyone's uh well not break but probably mean that in existing implementations would ignore the session uh if they were going to render it on a map and say you could turn up there because it doesn't have a location anymore um but implementations that support virtual events which would the, anyone who's who's going to implement the stuff we're talking about today would then be able to render those as virtual events and correctly represent them is um sorry is that a, not a mute point in a way about the location bit because we're not allowed to leave our houses anyway um just having like an icon if you like i don't know say a, a camera icon for ease of relevant reference next to the listing people would see that it's a virtual event because I, well, I, I don't think anyone's going to be turning up to their local gll or everyone active gym because we're not allowed you'd be surprised yeah, well yeah, yeah there is that yeah <laughs> well, I suppose it's, and I suppose it's the, it's the point that Lois raised earlier that actually, um, it, it's not now; it's the interim period, isn't it? It's 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 the like what in three weeks when some people are allowed out if you're in certain parts of the country and other people aren't, and the lockdown goes into the because it isn't the prediction that the the lockdown is going to go from being a hard lockdown to then softening in different in, in waves and then hard and soft, whatever happens next. So there'll be a chance that we'll be living in a situation where some stuff is virtual and some stuff is physical for a while while they manage this. And then it goes into full uh, physical and virtual mixed again. So I guess it's that it's the interim where people might get confused. And critically, the the um, the data consumer that I'm trying to, you know, let 
those consumers that do not currently have the capabilities to rapidly update how they consume data feeds. And so we need to be able to make sure that they can continue to do so without making too many changes uh, between now and the next few months. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I, I'd suggest, yeah, I agree. Oh, just wanted to check how that would work, but yeah, fine. Does that make sense, Izzy? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted yeah. to make sure that we hadn't forgotten about them. I'm sure we hadn't, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I think that's dealt with. Um, ah, okay. Um, we do still need to deal with maximum virtual attendee capacity and remaining virtual attendee capacity. Um, I think these are fairly unproblematic. I, I think there's a, in the, as, in, as in the case that uh, Nick instanced of an instructor who only wants to have, say, 10 students on a streaming site, um, this would be, these would be properties that would allow that to be, that use case to be met. Um, there is kind of a nomenclature point in that maximum attendee capacity um, currently exists in the specification uh, and is implicitly physical, but not explicitly so. This is a mismatch with schema.org, which has got minimum and maximum, uh, sorry, which was, has got maximum physical attendee capacity, but not uh, maximum attendee capacity. So I guess it's a question of niceness of the specification. Um, I think given the previous conversation, we want to not break things gratuitously. Um, so I think my proposal would be just to add these two um, data points to the specification and not worry about tinkering with the nomenclature of pre-existing um, attributes until, again, we're graduating out of beta phase. Sorry, Tim, the, the schema.org does, does have maximum attendee capacity. Is that what you're saying? It does still have it. I thought it just had maximum physical attendee capacity. No, no, they've kept those. They've got all three. They've kept they've the old three. one oh, as well. Okay, right, okay. Um, yeah, this is, this is a really un unfortunate thing because uh, for them, this is really unfortunate because you can't easily deprecate things on schema.org because there's millions of websites using it. Um, but but because because when they they obviously did, didn't think this about about this particular scenario when they implemented it in the first place. So this transition from attendee and to so split between physical and um, virtual is um, yeah, it's, it's it's a massive pain for um, and and for the booking spec as well. Like everything that relies on having a number of spaces remaining, mm -hmm. and now effectively you've got two different mechanisms. If it's a mixed event to book a thing, and two different uh, attendee counts to to keep track of. Um, but I want I, I wonder in in this in the short term whether um, actually to even simplify it further, we don't we don't adopt I purposely don't adopt maximum physical attendee capacity and just put maximum virtual attendee capacity into beta and therefore um, that's um, but but then see to be honest the other thing is that if we if people were trying to adopt the adapt the booking spec to make bookings against the, the stuff um, then that's still problematic because you really just want to make bookings against however many spaces are left so um so yeah so I, I so we could we could adopt it but i i i wonder whether if, if we do adopt it we shouldn't really push it that hard because i don't know um it's probably more of a kind of point of information maximum virtual attendee capacity rather than anything that should be used in a, a in a calculation could we uh, i say we as a as a random possibility why is there the potential to move or sorry add the maximum attendee capacity as an option to our virtual location hmm how, how, you mean put it inside the lo virtual location itself yeah and then there, uh, and that would then create a distinction between the maximum attendee capacity on an event which would strictly refer to the physical and the maximum attendee capacity on the virtual location sure yeah yeah the challenge there is is is, is it, it doesn't fit with the schema.org modeling pattern because you're 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 putting a if you imagine the way that schema thinks about things is um that the that, that any any 
different type uh, can be taken in isolation and exists on its own in its own right. So um, you might, that virtual location in theory could exist uh, outside of the event and be, you know, used by multiple events and, and et cetera. So because and that's why that's why it's a different type of thing. So putting the capacity on the location itself would infer the capacity of, of that location. But I can see what you're saying, because if it's a Zoom room and the Zoom room's got 20 capacity, is that what you mean? Then actually that Zoom yeah, room indeed. does have I, 20. I think I yeah. think that actually correlates with what you've just said, that the virtual location has a virtual capacity, and by applying the capacity to that location, it is semantically correct. Um, it may not line up perfectly with what a schema event suggests, but given that virtual location is an extension on Open Active's part anyway, I don't think that would be... And I, I believe that can work in isolation, in accordance with a, um, a, a schema spec uh, that you yeah. could take that virtual location and have that attendee capacity attached to that location really interesting point yeah yeah um huh. i am thinking that i was over ambitious in hoping to get all of these issues resolved within this time frame and i'm skeptical of getting them done in the next nine minutes um is there a possibility for people for an overflow meeting tomorrow morning? Or is that simply not doable? Or, or I mean, how much more have we got to go here? I mean, could we, could, could we just kind of press on until the hour if, I mean, I, well, I know it's not. I, I, I can't, time. I can't, I, I need to go in nine minutes time. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, What's left on the agenda? Uh, well, there's the guidance around the use of these various um, new uh, beta properties. And then there's also revisiting the question of um, uh, interactive modes um, and what that should be called. And then early in the call, I believe Brett, although I might be misremembering, asked a question about licensing and restrict restriction of use in relationship to, um, I believe it was asynchronous videos at this point. Uh, yeah, it's more to do with like, it's, it might just be our sector specific, really. There's a huge debate argument row at the minute. Um, there are very <laughs> various licenses that a lot of our instructors need because they include music. And there's the very good grey beige area on who's responsible for it, whether it's the platform, whether it's the instructor, whether it, but either way, there's a variety of licenses that need to be in place mm -hmm. to stop breach of copyright. Right. Okay. Um, and, and depending on whether the class is a two way, one way or pre recorded, there needs to be a, a disclaimer for health and safety. Because obviously, if you're doing a class in a studio or a gym, mm -hmm. the venue is aware of health and safety issues to make sure there's not bits of rope lying around so you fall over it. But if you're doing it in your living room, you, you, you know it's not a it's not a space designed normally to do exercise. Mm -hmm. So there's a you know there's a an insurance side of it for for coverage mm -hmm. and duty of care. Okay, I mean, that sounds like a significant point, and I, I would imagine that this applies broadly to other people on the call in many cases. Um, I think what I'm going to have to do is schedule another follow up W3C call um, for as soon as possible. Um, um t t sorry, Tim, can I just check that the two, the two outstanding actions you had were what were the, the name of preferred camera on or whatever. And what was the other one? Uh, the other one was guidance. Which properties are included and not? Okay, yeah, fair enough. Uh, guidance is more involved. Yeah, uh, it's really involved topic. Okay. Um, so it seems to me, um, hmm. I mean, I can I can carry on hosting the discussion if we wanted to proceed anyway, but I don't know if that's or if it's preferable to do it tomorrow. I mean, it's it's not like we've already waited a few days, so I guess an extra day won't make a difference, will it? Well, I'm just worried about the logistics of people's availability, though. We've got a good quorum right now. Um, yeah. 
I'm happy to hand sharing over to you. However, um, recording is going to be a bit of an issue. Uh, you'd have to make me host and I could pick up the recording. Well, I guess it depends on it. What, what does everyone think who's here now? Would you, would you rather press on for until, until the hour and, and try and finish this or should we pick this up tomorrow? Where, where are we? What are we thinking? Happy to press on, Nick. Uh, the sooner the better. Sooner the better, right. Okay. Um, I'm going to have to drop, drop off, but I'm happy for you guys to kind of wrap it up. Okay, Nick, I am making you host. Dangerous game, huh? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Nick's big power move. <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. That's, that's, yeah, uh, totally not, not intended. Uh, we'll, have okay. to, we'll have to catch up on this later, Nick. Thank you all for joining the call. Uh, I think it's been an extremely productive uh, and pretty coherent session given the circumstances. Uh, so I'll look forward to catching up with Nick on what gets decided with regard to the remaining points. Thanks, Tim. Nick, is there anything else you need from me? Uh, no, I think I think if you can see, uh, can you see I've started recording? Has that worked? Uh, yeah, that's what it's showing. Uh, hang on a sec. Uh, uh, it was just in regards to the new, um, uh, to how event status, uh, do, did we decide whether or not the um, event attendance not the event attendance mode, sorry, the, um, the uh, has moved online event status has changed. It's not really relevant for this issue, though, is it? Because it's not actually expressed in there. Well, what I'd, I'd written down was that we, would, we decided to, um, to not, to, we wouldn't, wouldn't need that anymore because the location and affiliated location had replaced the need for that. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So we don't need that anymore. Um, which has um, As I said a, a moment ago, we... Hmm. Sorry, go on. Uh, sorry, as I said a moment ago, we haven't actually had the chance to discuss the level issue. We uh, it was put in at the last minute into the agenda. Sure. Yeah. So I guess we can cover that after this. Um, so so I guess has anyone else got any apart from um, start time, which I will uh, amend now. Um, has anyone else got any any thoughts on this apart from that we're obviously going to be taking on board the affiliate location uh, feedback from before. Uh, did we reach a consensus on maximum virtual attendee capacity versus putting maximum attendee capacity into the virtual location? I think we said I think we said we were going to put it into the virtual location as a beta field. That was where we were. Okay, great. Um, it looks like you're saying that an offer is required in a session series object. Is that what you mean? Uh, it's required, that's a good point. So offer is required either in session series or in scheduled session. Um, yeah, because we've, we've had uh, issues before where, uh, particularly on the, the model validator, uh, it says that there has to be an offer given for a session series, but we mm -hmm. have some cases where people might have each scheduled session in a session series has a different price. So we can't, we, 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 there's no way we can know that there will be one applicable price to all of them. Yes. So we'll, that would follow the same rules as the current spec. So I'll, we'll yeah, exactly. To make sure that that, yeah, that, that covers it. There's nothing special here. Um, okay. Um, great. So, uh, just right. I'm just making like the clear notes of this. So, um, location to affiliated location. Uh, maximum is moving into virtual. Um, and sorry, was there was there any other changes to this apart from that start time issue, start date issue? Sorry, is that now everything? Um, is there any uh, nuances with regards to um, recommended versus optional properties, or are we all of the ones that are listed as recommended going to be recommended? Suggestion here was that they were going to be recommended, uh, but they could be made optional. Is there any you're thinking particularly that could be optional or should be? 
Um, you'll have to forgive my ignorance on the specific uh, details of the of, of the difference between recommended and optional. Certainly, recommended seems more well used within the opportunity model specification. Yeah, all recommended means is that when well, practically what it means is when you run the validator, it comes up with a little thing saying you should probably think about adding this field. Um, and it's something that if it's recommended, uh, I guess implementers should think about doing that versus not doing it. Optionals generally just if your system supports this in optional, then put it in. If it doesn't, then don't. Where it's recommended, it's more if your system doesn't support it, you should think about adding it as a new field. With that in mind, um, do we want to consider virtual location to be um, an optional field then, given that not all um, events will have virtual locations? Uh, as opposed to a recommended field? Yeah. Um... Well, I suppose that yes, that's a good point. So, the, well, with recommended, it's more that if you, so it's, it's whether you support it or not versus. So it might still not be there if you said, I mean, if you if you've implemented it, you might decide that it's null in this case, so you won't include it. Um, so recommended is more about if it was optional, it would almost be saying to implementers, don't worry about it. If you don't if you don't already capture that information, don't worry about it. Whereas it sounds like what we're saying is, if you're not capturing that, you should probably capture it because it makes it more useful for the consumer. Which is more in line with recommended. Okay. Often this is where we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I think there's probably I, I think the list of required is basically everything that's currently required plus attendance event attendance mode and everything else has gone into recommended. And I suppose I suppose that the final question would be: Does anyone see anything in recommended they think should be required or we could reasonably require? Because I, I guess a lot of that. Well, like an initial look at it, I thought, well, we probably can't ask as a compulsory thing for it, all of this stuff to be in there, but obviously it's a nice to have and we, we, we want all of it, which is why it's then recommended. Uh, yeah, I definitely can't see anything that should be required as opposed to recommended. Great. Is everyone else in that same position? Yeah, that's good to me. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Super. Okay, that's great. So, um, and then on, on the on-demand events, if you scroll down to the next section, exactly the same question here. Um, obviously we haven't got the um, event attendance mode as distinction because we don't need it because it's a, it's a special type of event called on-demand event. Um, is there anything in there? It sounds like we, we, we wanna add to the recommended for on-demand um, the video property we talked about earlier or something, is that? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think there's some debate over whether it should be work featured or um, work performed. Um, but I think that's a semantic issue, and they're, they're very similar fields. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're, different interpretation. Yes, I think work performed is a um, is a is isn't it a more general version of work featured? Sorry, the other way around. Work featured is more general than work performed. That certainly seems to be the impl um, the implication of the titles of those fields, but I couldn't tell you any more specific okay so uh so that uh whichever one of those we pick uh I, I i imagine work if you just check the i'm just on schema.org now if you just check the description i think it says that one's one's a sub property of the other um so maybe we should take the most general form if that, if that works So if you if you look at work performed, uh, I think it's yes. Work featured is the more general form. Are you, you are we are we happy with that? Yeah, that sounds good to me. Fantastic. So work featured is what we use. Fantastic. So work featured is recommended on demand events. Um, and do we have anyone else has anything to add to on demand apart from that which we discussed before, um, or thinks that the required and recommended aren't right? It's just a note that um, it's also work presented. 
um, in the, which is in the context of a movie that is more sort of another sort of specific. If we're going to work featured, I think that, so if you say that just covers, it's a thing happening there, which is probably good enough for this. Yes, because I suppose, uh, yes, I guess work, work presented, the movie presented during this event. Interesting. Whereas the uh, work featured is more generic. Interesting, Chris. I thought you'd be you'd be wanting more generic than less gen uh, generic, given that <laughs> race, well, please. Uh, I, I was actually voting for work featured to say oh, right. that I wanted to point out there was a work presented alongside work performed, since we only mentioned work performed previously. Yes. Go um, ahead. Okay. I, I think work featured is actually probably the the, the most. It's a general thing that says it's in there. I think that, that I, I agree with it more from a democratic perspective. Okay, perfect, great. So we work features um, the one. Could um, could the virtual location for on demand events be required? Um, virtual location for on demand events. Oh, there isn't a virtual lo location for on demand events. Oh, it, it appears in the example at the bottom, unless I haven't refreshed the page soon. Oh no, you're totally right, and that is that is that doesn't match the, um, the spec above it. So that example would then be wrong, I guess. Um, but it sounds like actually what we're talking about is in, if we replace where it says beta work, um, virtual location with work performed and uh, a video object, um, then we're, we're pr pretty much there then, aren't we? So the example was kind of talking about the same. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that makes sense to me. So I've just done that. So if you refresh the page, um, you'll see it's now changed. Um, Everything else, all the other properties there still still work. Does that, does that make sense? Are we happy with that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to take that as, as yes, that's great. For, crack on. Um, I just so, want one last. Um, oh is yeah. the is the work featured? Um, uh, obviously, it isn't in the schema, but um, is work featured something that we would want to make required, or is that too restrictive? I yes, that's a good question. I wonder whether it is only the only reason I say that might be too restrictive is because if it's behind a paywall, you won't actually have the URL of the video itself. So maybe maybe it has to be required, but should be recommended. Sorry, maybe it has to be recommended and can't be required. From that perspective, the work featured can be filled with the exception of the URL, which is optional under schema. Uh, I think the video so object thinking... is. I think I think creative work is is a such a broad um, schema that I think most of that most of the use case can be handled. Um, and making it required shouldn't be too restrictive as long as something is in there. Well, I suppose the question is, are we going to end up in a situation where people are arbitrarily adding content just to hit the required, um, you know, to, to make sure that it passes validation? Because so I, I think further, maybe further context is, if you don't have a thing that's in the required section, then your data won't pass, you'll get errors from the validator and some implementations might then, if they're using the validator to ingest the feed might throw that throughout the record so i guess it would be like very strictly required i.e your, your feed's invalid if, if you haven't got it um but so so there's a risk that people might just fill fill it just to make sure the validator passes um but if if we think that um but i guess what, what's the value of that though so let's say that let's say that you haven't got a youtube url because it's a private youtube url and you're behind a paywall um what other fields in that uh, work featured are you um, would then be of interest, and are therefore we. So I mean, it's almost like we're not we're making work featured required, but then, but what what property within work featured are we making required such that it's worth making work featured itself required? So I'm just I'm just taking a look at the uh, specifically the video object schema now to see what sort of useful information could be uh, could could be important. There. Sure, sure. 
Well, I suppose it, yes, it's the thing. If, if anyone's got any ideas from the use cases they're aware of why that should be a required thing, but I'm, I'm kind of um, let's see, yeah, let's see what you um, you come up with there. Um, does it, so just with that, that's our final point. Does anyone else, um, while Lewis is looking through, um, does anyone else have any other final concluding comments on this? Are we, are we happy with everything else as, as discussed? Yeah. Yeah, from, from looking through it, it seems like um, it seems like there's 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 little difference between making work featured re required versus recommended since the since it's uh, a schema, it, it can be completely unfilled and and still be possible. So I don't think it makes any difference. So it may as well stay recommended. Okay. Uh, right. I've just done that. Updated the issue. So it's it's in the fantastic. Um, okay. Wonderful. So I think that leaves us with. Um, unless I've missed any other issues, uh, the level question, um, which hopefully is a quick one, and then um, what words we should use for pre preferred camera on or interactive is interactive or other things. So um, maybe we'll just jump into the levels one quickly because that's that's a new topic, and then revert to the um, um, at the very end to the camera question. And please be thinking about the answer to that um, <laughs> while we're going. So. Um, uh, this is, I'm just going to send you the link for the levels conversation. This is basically revisiting an issue that we spoke about at length over several calls um, previously. And I think Tom's actually, unfortunately, he's just had to drop off in here, but he uh, had the final uh, comments on there. So just sending that round. Um, and then this is just a quick check that we're all happy with this, basically, because I think we kind of got there last time. Um, and at least happy with it for the um, for the sake of uh, of doing this now. Um, so, uh, can you guys see that link I just posted in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I can even potentially share that share the screen here. Oh, no, I can't. Uh, not to worry. So, um, so yeah. So the question there is at the bottom of uh, of that issue. There's a comment, and then that comment it kind of highlights that there's two um, two types really that are the main uh, two types of, of of level. There's beginner, which is its own thing, and then separately from beginner, there's um, everything else as a as a distinction. Um, so, uh, if uh, and what that would mean is that you can um, you can basically say that you've got uh, where's the where's the example further up uh, okay well, well I, I guess I'll I'll see if we can get to consensus on this really quickly basically what we're saying is that if we agree in principle that there's a level which is beginner and then there's other levels which are not beginner which depending on what kind of sport you're in, could be complicated or could be simple. It could be as simple as advanced and intermediate, it could be uh, level one, two, and three. Um, but though we don't try and create any equivalence between those things. Um, what I mean by that is that if you're, if you're doing a search uh, and you've got a front end and you've got different levels, then on the left-hand side, a bit like in Amazon, you would see um, a beginner would always be there, and then depending on the search results, you might have a mixture of other levels which are available under um, experienced. So you've got beginner and experienced as a two levels. And if you expand experienced, you'd have level three. You might also have um, intermediate. You might also have like a bunch of different items that, because they all mean such different things that it doesn't make sense to try and bunch them all together. Um, and so, what I wonder for the sake of this is that it seems that the online classes, the really important thing is that we've got beginner as a well-defined thing, and then, and then everything else is kind of, people will know what they're looking for. So for the sake of getting to a consensus on this, I wonder if we could just agree that beginner is beginner, and then other things are, um, whatever they are, people can adopt, uh, adopt those um, separately. Um, and actually, even as I'm uh, even as I'm talking this through, I wonder whether, um, yeah, 
um, whether it might be easier to just have a, an agreement that the word beginner should be what we use in um, uh, in the in the field that's there, rather than even trying to adopt anything more complicated given the timescales. Because I was going to suggest, why don't we just agree that we just just take this as it is? But even this is complicated to it for everyone to implement. So maybe if we just had a beginner field with guidance suggesting that sorry a uh, guidance suggesting that we use the word beginner in the level field to indicate indicate beginner consistently for now that might just be enough to get us to where we need to go without trying to dig into all of this given the time scales and then not likely yeah to for everyone. I, I i think this is this is a this is a massive mountain to to um to climb and um just to throw unfortunately i'm very sorry about this but obviously we've not been privy to previous calls just to throw a spanner into the works um on sports suite our use case currently is that we have created skill levels that are you know, reasonably arbitrary across um across all sports in fact we've actually gone ahead and done that for our clients to make use of and what we've done is we've we've created the classic beginner, intermediate, advanced. We also have right. a notion of mixed, wherein, wherein the the class, um, the um, the particular activity has mixed levels of skill level, and below beginner, we actually also have taste session, which is a kind of a special case that we've grouped into our skill set. So, uh, obviously, we've been saying that beginner is beginner. However, in our specific use case, we've got um, a, a level even below that to allow. Um, and and that that's not to say that w when it comes to exporting and importing data that couldn't be rolled into one for beginner, but um, it certainly muddies the waters even further. Which I'm yeah, understood. Um, oh, hello, I lost you there. Um, yeah, un understood. Understood. Okay. Well, so um, it sounds like what we're saying is in that case, are we are we are we generally happy to just just standardising the guidance on the word beginner for now, um, for the sake of the virtual classes, um, and then we can pick this whole other problem up with probably several hours of time at some future point. Yep, I think it's clever. Uh, I mean, beginner is the most important thing for a, from a filter perspective. Um, you know, I want to find beginner things or not, or I know what I'm looking for and I have more information and have more ways to pass the description or whatever brilliant great and that might well be implemented as a, as a tick box in some uh, implementations i suppose is this for beginner for if you're a if you're um a publisher if you're a booking system okay wonderful uh right so we're losing people rapidly as we kind of conclude the um the, the call now so has anyone finally got any thoughts on this preferred camera on situation um or what we could call that uh, is interactivity preferred uh the boolean interact is what's the what was it is interactivity preferred is interactivity preferred yeah um, i did notice that um while we were talking about creative work stuff that there's an interactivity type field on that which is the predominant mode of learning supported by the learning resource Active, expositive, oh. mix. Well, that's good. So it was, it was possibly something to um, to, uh, to leave us. That's great. Um, interactive. Uh, what was it? Where, where was where was that? Sorry, you found that on uh, the event. Schema dot all creative work, and it's got a property called interactivity type, which is a um, text field with a that number of values fantastic so um that, that looks that looks really um uh the, the values aren't just like defined in the enumeration though except for values are oh i see act, active expositive or mixed right um, as well of course we the um open active events do, do not inherit creative work do they they only inherit events yeah, that's right. That's right. I just put that on the screen for everybody. Sorry, I just realised I can do that. So the so are we so the the options are so far we've got this as a proposal and we've got um, is interactivity preferred as a boolean um, as a um, proposal. Does anyone else have any other proposals or thoughts, or is it just the debate, final debate of the call between these two? 
Um, I mean, from what was brought up earlier, it seems like the limitation of both is not describing how it's interactive. So you were talking about needs video or needs microphone before. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think we said we probably wouldn't mind, uh, we don't need to know necessarily what kind of interaction it is at the moment. Uh, it's, uh, because of the simplicity of this, we're keener just to make sure it's it's easy to adopt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think Izzy suggested that sort of thing could go in attendee instructions or something if necessary. Oh, I remember now. Yeah. Sorry. Um, okay. So, sounds like it's those two then. And then I guess the question is from the schema stuff: is this is this is this relevant? So, interactivity type active it sounds like these types of learning are probably not designed for what we're talking about here so then i guess the question is should we use interactivity type or reuse it um for for the sector kind of specific stuff or should we go with a a, a beta right now that's a boolean does uh does anyone know what expositive is supposed to mean here positive i mean it's the equivalent of no interaction basically like exposition so a monologue or something like that right right <laughs> right okay. yeah i think if you think of a, a lecture series um which is probably where this is coming from uh you know you've either got a, a ted talk where you're sitting and watching it or you've got um a uh, a, a workshop that's like a, a zoom call um, or you've got something that's halfway between where maybe there's a lecture for a discussion, which is how a lot of webinars work. Uh, so you'd sort of, I think that's how I imagine that that would be applied. And I don't have any direct knowledge of this kind of stuff for this. It's just reading between the lines. Yeah, sure. So I guess, so I mean, what's our feeling on this? Is this, is it something that we, I mean, it doesn't seem like it's a direct mapping, but should we, should we provide guidance to do that mapping, I guess? Um, or? I mean, the fact that it has three values, uh, when I feel, I feel like, like we were saying before, um, preferred and not preferred, basic seem sufficient for now. I mean, maybe it's easy to just go with something that has two values because uh, that will simplify UXs. Um, UX design for apps and stuff, where they're wondering what to do with mixed. Yeah, that's true. And I suppose the other thing is, if we did implement it, it would be a beta field, so we could always migrate to the interactivity type later if we wanted to create a mapping between the two. Um, okay, what, what do we think? Yeah, it seems like we have got a slight pivot between the, the sort of the gray area of preferred as opposed to required or not required mm. um, is, is this a tri-state thing that's required preferred not required well so this is interesting so we haven't found anyone so far that requires it but i guess it could require it in theory um as a as a, but then i guess you know, you're kind of forcing the participant to use their camera so this is, this, I don't know, not, not something that we've seen so far, but maybe unfortunately we've lost Brett to ask that question specifically to, but um, uh, yeah, it sounds like, well, it sounds like they, um, it sounds like preferred is more than, um, more relevant than required or optional in some ways, because it's not, most people would say, I'd like you to, because that's what I want you to do. But ultimately, if you really don't want to show your face for some reason, then I'm not going to force you. Um, I still want you in my class. For, for the purposes of inclusivity seems to be that that sentiment so that doesn't that sentiment isn't really conveyed with optional or required um so i guess you could have required yeah like you say required preferred and then not nothing uh but does anyone see required as as something that seems to have like come up a lot as is a possibly pressing requirement rather than preferred as in like you have to have stuff on I mean, I, I guess it, hypothetically, there might be a particular type of class where you must have a webcam to participate. Otherwise, you know, you, you, but I imagine that's, yeah, I imagine that's probably more edge casey, isn't it? Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, 
Well, well, okay. Well, so, so as as simplicity was was um, the guiding force of this originally, should we stick with the Boolean value is is inter is interactivity preferred um, for now? And then if it seems that people are starting to put in the description, um, I don't mean preferred, I mean required for the edge case, um, which I guess will will be because ultimately the reason we want this in is actually for the filter, right? So if you're filtering, you want to look for things that where you, where you want your video on. You're going to look for those things that have interactively preferred. And if you don't want the video on, you'll have those things that don't have interactively preferred. Um, and so it, it serves the purpose for the filter. And I suppose in terms of just making sure that the, the, the session's well described enough for you to know if it's required or preferred or optional, those things, I guess, can come in the, the free text field. And they, you're very unlikely to want to filter on things that require you to have a webcam versus just prefer you to have a webcam. Because I guess if you're the consumer, you want to use your webcam or not. And then you're just, it's a, it's a, it's a Boolean thing that you're searching for. I want to use my webcam or I don't. Uh, and I suppose as, as long as the, this is sufficient to, to serve that need, then maybe we don't need to worry about describing things further at this stage. Yeah, that makes sense to me. From a from an infrastructure perspective, I can't think of a single platform where a webcam and a microphone are not optional, where either one of them is not optional. I can't think of a single one that you can physically not join without that equipment. That's true. Although I suppose there's a question of do you join and have everything on mute, um, which may be what. But, but yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So. So does that? But sorry, were you supporting that? That then is it? Were you saying therefore, therefore it's sufficient to have a boolean value, or were you saying something else? Actually, I'm kind. I'm kind of suggesting that required isn't isn't possible in the current uh, in the right. current capabilities of any platform. Um, so preferred is definitely the right uh, you know um, term Language. to use, um, yeah. and that required actually is not something that we that anybody is is capable of supporting at, at the present time. So it shouldn't really be considered at this point. Okay, great. Uh, that makes sense to me. Um, great. So, in our in our dwindling numbers, is everyone happy with that? To, that we we crack on with that as to the app that resolve. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, I think that's that's everything. Then, unless anyone's got any other business at this point. Who's on here? Great. Okay. Well, thank you so much for um, persevering with. Uh, oh, that's a weird bit. echo, isn't it? Thank you so much for persevering with all, all of this uh, and um, and contributing. And uh, we'll we'll aim as soon as uh, as I mentioned on the first, humanly possible, to get this into a guidance and um, into the validator. So if you could just um, keep your eyes out for a follow-up email um, or link that we might be slacking you directly, um, depending on how you heard about this call. Um, which will just be this is everything we've done, we've agreed uh, in one place, and if you could just check that we haven't missed anything, um, or maybe we'll set a deadline like midday tomorrow or something for any final. Um, oh, you didn't mention that thing. It, we've got a consensus from everything, so it will just be that the notes weren't correct or something, and we can easily tweak and change that without another call. So if you see something in there that's not what you thought the understanding was on the call, then please flag that. Um, and um, and then if we don't hear anything from that little that little period of review, which is much much shorter than usual, it would usually be two weeks. Um, so we'll we'll put that out um, as I said as soon as possible, and give maybe a half a day or a day for review. And if nothing gets flagged, then um, we're all good to go. Um, so uh, will that, the, will the GitHub issues be updated with the uh, changes suggested? Yes. Yeah. I'll go, well, I will go through the, the immediately after this and do that. Um, but please feel free if you've commented, if you see those being updated and it, it, again, it doesn't match, then please do quickly comment or um, and likewise, if any of the points you've, you wanted to express, you just put them on the GitHub issues, that would help out as well. So if there's any of the points that you've, um, you've raised and, and that, that, that have been agreed. Um, but yeah, I'll be going through those now and, um, and updating those. Okay, thank you. Great. Any more for any more? I don't think so. Fantastic. Great. Well, thank you so much for everybody for your time and um, have a great rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you guys.